On the uh, 24th uh, verse of the 10th chapter, and uh, Paul has just talked about uh, in the 23rd verse uh, that he's talked about all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. Uh, and so he goes in here to the 24th verse. He says, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Uh, whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So he had talked to them previously uh, where we talked about last week about going to the temples and partaking uh, in the feasts at the temple. And the meat there had been sacrificed uh, there were, you know, loud and raucous parties going on and a lot of things a Christian just shouldn't be involved in. And so what he's talking about now is he's talking about, when he talks about another man's wealth, another man's well-being. And while we have Christian liberty and we have freedom, we, our rights can't supersede what is loving towards our brothers and sisters. And so as he's talking about these things, he's, he's trying to get them to understand you do have religious freedom, you do have freedom to, to partake and be involved in things, but we have to make sure we're not being a stumbling block. And so he's talking about being loving towards our brothers and sisters, and there's not a black and white law for everything in the Bible. Uh, you know, there's not a, you know, we have the, the Ten Commandments that were based on law, and when we got into the new covenant, we have, we have what we have, the, the message of the cross and the message of grace. And so what Paul is telling them is everything's not going to be black and white. But you have to understand while you have liberty to do certain things, if those things interfere with, with someone's walk with Christ, with God, uh, we shouldn't be involved in those things. So when he says whatever is sold at the shambles, he's talking about their... Uh, that's like a meat market. And so what would happen is these, the Corinthian Christians were going to the meat market to purchase meat. And some of the meat there had been uh, used for offerings and sacrifices, and some of, the, some of it had not. Some of it was just regular meat. And so the Christians, some of the Corinthians were concerned about, well, what if I get some meat that's been sacrificed? And so Paul tells them, don't worry about that for conscience sake. He said, he's telling them the, the earth is the Lord's. And so basically that meat, you know, if it was a, a cow or sheep or goat or whatever it may have been, that meat is of the Lord's. It was the Lord's when it was alive in an animal and when it was dead. And so the issue, not that this meat had been sacrificed, the issue was they were going to the temple. And um, as he's, he's talking about this, we look at this, uh, with, we look at this today. So the issue was the idol worshiping, not with the meat. And we think about this today, and, and sometimes as Christians, we get so focused on these small, minute details that we miss the whole point. So uh, if you've purchased something that was created by slave labor, is that, is that a problem? If you've purchased something that's a, a quote-unquote an anti-Christian company or a company that does not have Christian values, is that a sin? And that's what Paul's talking about is we, we partake in these things and, and don't, don't get into that minute of a detail. Um, then there's times where someone you may be impressed on to, to not partake of a certain company or not partake of a, a certain product, and God may impart that to you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's for everyone. And so when he's talking about for conscious sake, he's saying, understand, everything, everything is coming from the Lord. And so not to get wrapped up in, okay, well, can I buy this meat or can I not buy this meat, that we don't want to be an offense or a stumbling block to our brothers, but there's certain things that we, we just don't go into. Uh, and he tells them when there's no law in place, we should consider the comfort and salvation of others. Um, and at the, at the end of the day, a lot of times when we come up on something and we're not for sure, that's when we go to God in prayer. That's in our daily prayer and our daily reading. God will show us those things. And as we, uh, as we study the scriptures, which is what we're doing tonight and taking it line by line and verse by verse, these things come to light and God will reveal them to us. And that's how we grow in, in this walk with God. Um, and everyone's in a, in a different 
space where, where they're walking at. You know, uh, some people are, are little bitty baby Christians. Some people are uh, child Christians or uh, teenage Christians or adult Christians. So we're all in different spaces. And so we have to understand that a, a, a brand new Christian may be struggling with something, and I don't want to be an offense to my brother or sister. I don't want to hinder them by something that I have the liberty to do. So he says uh, in, the, in the 27th, he said, If any of them that believe not bid you to go to a feast, and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no questions for conscience' sake. And what he's talking about here is not a feast that is at the temple, but he is talking about a non-believer inviting you to their home. And they say, hey, you know, come and sit at the table and, and, and eat, and let's dine, let's have lunch, let's have dinner. He's telling them, go and eat. And we know that Jesus often ate with the sinners. Uh, and he would sit and eat with them, and, and there was um, not so much a fellowship, but he was with them. And, you know, we've, called, we've been called as the church to be separated, but we're not isolated from the world. So, no, we, you know, sometimes today we see in modern churches, they want to get as close as they can to uh, the world and, and get just as close as we can to it and, and almost match it. And that's not what we're called to do. What we're called to do is we're to be separate, but we shouldn't be isolated. We, we shouldn't ever not be around sinners because we have, the, we have the, to go and to spread this gospel. So un understanding that. So that's what he's telling them. If you're invited to someone's house, go and eat. Don't worry about, was the meat offered to, to an idol? What, you know, where did it come from? Sit down and eat. And he says, but if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So, having a Christian host or a non-Christian host that points out that the meat has been sacrificed, um, it, it, this sounds contradictory to what he just said because he said, eat it and don't worry about it. But what he's getting at is what, what's the spirit behind it? You know, is, is someone that's possibly a non-Christian, are they trying to trip you up? Are they trying to make a big deal out of something and make a scene? He said, that's fine, just don't eat it. Or if you're with, a, with someone and then maybe that's a struggle for them, or maybe they feel like, yeah, I, I can't eat of that meat, then he's saying, that's fine, don't eat of that meat. And so you can see the, the bigger picture here of what he's trying to get to is we, we, should, we should go through these things with love, and that there's not, sometimes there's not a black and white rule, it's okay, where is he going with this? Or what, what's the purpose of this? Are they inviting me to be friendly? Then let me show myself friendly and go sit at your table and eat it with you. If you're, if you're trying to say, oh, well, look, see, you do the same thing the, the, the sinners do, the heathens do, then understand that and have that discernment. And so, again, he says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And that's the thing is, everything, everything on the earth is God's. You know, it says that, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So he, that, that is his, set down, we eat it, we enjoy it, but understand what is, what is the person that's coming to you, what is their intent. So in the 29th verse, he says, Conscious, I say not thy own, uh, but of the others. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if by grace... Be a partaker, why as evil spoken, of which for that I give thanks. And so in the 28th here, he's saying, um, if I am not offended by eating of meat, then don't allow that to bother you if there's another Christian and they're eating meat that's been sacrificed in the temple. If that bothers you, fine, don't partake of it, but don't cut off relationship with uh, another Christian because they're, they're able to do that. And we see that sometimes that God will speak to us personally and will say, yeah, you shouldn't be involved with that. Or you shouldn't be, that's not something that you should do. But that's not, it, it's not a decree to the whole church, it's to an individual person. And, and the reason for that and, the, and the, the behind that is sometimes it may be a temptation that we can't handle. It may be, um, 
it may be something that is leading you down a path that is not a good place for you. But for someone else, that's not an issue. Um, so he says, again, why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So he's saying, while we need to be aware of these things, it's not our job to judge someone else. It's not our job to say, oh, well, they're a sinner because they did this. It's our job to simply say, okay, here's where, here's where I feel like I'm at, and this is, what I, this is where I feel like God is leading me. And so at the same time, you know, we don't, we don't want to be a stumbling block. We don't want to be the reason that someone turns away from the gospel or someone doesn't give the gospel a chance. And so this is where, this is where it's so important with the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. And that's why being filled with the Spirit is so important because that's what he's there for. He's there for a guide. And there's times that as you grow in the Holy Spirit that God will speak to you and lead you a certain way. And you'll feel a tug on your heart, whether it be to speak to someone or whether it be to um, maybe not engage with something or not go somewhere. Uh, when I was a, a small, uh, I say a small boy, when I was a teenager, I'd went to this event and um, had a great time. Nothing happened. And the next day, my mother came in and talked to me. And she said, and she was very honest with me. She said, Chuck, I was praying this morning, and God said, you can't go, you can't go there anymore. And, of course, my response, like most teenagers, was, why? And she said, I don't know, but God told me, and you can't go. And so that's an example of that wasn't necessarily something that was wrong for everyone, but for, for whatever the reason, that was something I didn't need to go to. And it's so important that we follow that leading and that we understand that when that speaks to our heart, there's a reason that God is dropping that in our heart. Um, so if he's saying, you know, if it does not offend me uh, or my brother, partake of it. Um, and one of the things uh, as I was studying this is liberty within the limit of love. And as I read that in a commentary, that really kind of jumped off the page at me because we do have liberties in Christ, but we have to understand, again, I don't want to be an offense. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I don't want to be the reason that someone struggles in their walk with Christ. And so when we talk about things, um, you know, modest dress, um, we talk about I don't want to be a stumbling block to someone that's struggling with lust. And we forget about that sometimes. You know, we all come to church and we, we put on our clothes and we put on our best smile and we're friendly. And, but we all have things that we're dealing with. We all have struggles. We all have trials that we're going through. And so we want to remember that. We want to remember that I, it's, it's, I don't want to be a stumbling block to my brother or my sister. The 31st verse, he said, Wherefore, therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So everything we do, do it in, in, the, in the glory of God. And that's, our, that's, that's what we should do as Christians. And that's a question I think you can ask yourself. Is my behavior, is my action, is it glorifying God? And if it is, great. If it's not, then we need to adjust that behavior. And so in, in everything that you're doing in your life, that's, that should be in the back of my mind, is this glorifying God? Is what I'm doing, is it leading people to God or is it leading people away? And <clears throat> sometimes it's human nature. We take that, that, that statement of liberty, Christian liberty, and we say, how close can I get and how much can I get away with? Versus, Lord, let me get closer to you. You know, God, take the things out of my life that are a distraction. God, take the things, you know, take that desire away from me to be involved in these things that don't glorify you. And so that's the mindset Paul is trying to get the Corinthian Christians to have. He's trying to get them to have the mindset of walk closer to God, not walk as close as you can to the heathen. And we see that in modern church still. Uh, a lot of times... We want to press right up to the edge of, okay, this is what the world's doing, so we're going to mirror that. And, and that's not the case with the church. We shouldn't be mirroring the world. We should be separate from the world. And 
And so, again, our behavior shouldn't leave, lead others to sin. But the thing that Paul is pointing out here is we're not talking about offending the legalism of others. In other words, we're not saying allowing false doctrine. Um, you know, there's a big movement, you know, the coexist. Well, everybody just get along and, you know, just choose a religion and whatever it is. Paul's not saying that because there is a line there where we have to say, no, this is, this is not in the will of God. And Paul talks to the Galatians uh, and he tells them, I'll, I'll read this, he says, And brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross is ceased. I would that they were even cut off, which trouble you. So he's saying, um, you know, after Paul, uh, after the message of the cross began to come in, when Paul would leave a church, oftentimes the, the Jewish leaders would come in and they would say, yeah, that's good, but you also need to do this. You know, they would tell the Gentiles, well, you need to be circumcised. You need to follow this. And so Paul is telling them, why would I preach circumcision when that was under the law? And that's, not, that's not what God has said. And so uh, understanding he's really trying to paint a picture of where they should be in their walk with Christ. We're not going to allow false doctrine, and we're not going to say, oh yeah, that's okay, that's okay. We're going to stand and hold the line that, that God has and that God set forth, we understand with that there, within that there's liberties. And so, uh, again, you know, he's not saying that everything should be permissible. <clears throat> 33rd verse, he says, Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they be saved. And, and Paul, very simply, his goal here is he wants to see people saved. So that has to be our mindset. We're, we're to go and we're to spread this gospel. And, and no, we're not all evangelists or, or missionaries or things like that, but we are in the sense of we carry this gospel. We carry this message with the way we walk, with the way we talk. One of the most disheartening things to hear is you hear people that are in the service industries that are, are waiters or uh, wait staff and things like that. The, the least favorite day to work is on Sunday. Well, who's going out and eating on Sunday? It's the church. It's people get out of church and they go and they sit and they eat. And so are we carrying the message, uh, like Paul's saying, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved? And so, uh, you know, if I have to take a step back, if there's something that I have liberty in, but I realize that that is stum a stumbling block, and I take a step back, I'm taking a step back so that others may be saved. And you see this a lot of times with, with ministers, right? Because we, we hold pastors up to a very, very high standard. And so a lot of times there's things they're not involved in that it's not a sin for them to be involved in, but because they don't want to be a stumbling block to the people in their congregation. And so that's where Paul's saying there. So the 11th chapter, and the first verse here really kind of wraps up and, and kind of puts a bow on the 10th, on the 10th chapter. He says, uh, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And so he's telling them, follow my example. And he's not saying to follow the example of Paul the man, but to follow uh, Paul the follower of Christ. Uh, and he's saying that we should be a blessing to others uh, or to follow the example of God's order. And that's what we have to understand. Sometimes when we really dig into these scriptures, sometimes it, it can be confusing. And that's where, we, that's where our prayer life and our study life comes in, that God reveals those things to us. Because sometimes when you read scriptures, um, sometimes you either read over them and, and maybe you miss something, or you read it and it's just, you know, uh, if you've ever read something and you've just, you're like, I had no idea what I just read, right? And I'm not for sure what God's showing me. Sometimes we have to chew on it a little bit. Sometimes we have to put it on the back burner and come back and read it again. But as we read and as we study, we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal what God is saying in our work. <clears throat> so he goes into, now we go into uh, really the start of chapter 11 in the second verse. He says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remembered me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And he's praising them because this letter is a response to a letter that they've sent to him to say, here's the questions we have. And, and he's telling them, I appreciate you asking questions. I appreciate you being inquisitive. 
And as we, as we learn this gospel and as we learn this word, we should. We should be asking questions. You know, when we come to Bible study, that's what we're doing. We're, we're learning and we're hearing the Word. And so they had a hunger and a desire. They wanted to be better with it. And so they're asking these questions. And so Paul is, is saying, I'm glad that you're keeping me in mind. I'm glad that you're keeping me updated on things. Um, and he's talking to them when he says um, ordinances. He's talking about traditions. Now, sometimes we think of man-made traditions in the church, and those can have a negative impact, right? There's things, there's traditions and things that have come down through the years that uh, they're really not tied to the gospel. It's just we've always done that, right? Um, but as he's talking here, he's talking about the traditions that were based on what God had shown the Apostle Paul. And so there are things that are in church. He talks about a little bit later, he talks about uh, communion, and so communion is one of those things. Now, man has turned it into a, a man's tradition of, you know, there's some places they take communion every week, and, or they've tried to kind of take and take things out of context. But what he's talking about is the tradition of communion that God has set forth to remember what his son Jesus did. And so he's commending them that continue to, to follow those tra traditions, continue to follow those things that you've been taught in the Word. Verse 3, it says, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So this gets into some scripture that is, it, it tends to go against the grain of our, what our modern society says. And again, you, you have to go at this with not, not what does is, what is our culture say right now, but what does the Word of God say and what is it really saying? So as we dig into this, understand where Paul is coming from with this. And so, he's, again, he says, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So he's, he's speaking more than just cultural expectations. Um, and depending on the culture, there was different expectations on women at that time. There were some where women had more responsibilities. There were some where they had less. But what he is getting at, he's not saying that a woman is inferior to a man in any way, but she is, is subject or subordinate after the fall of man. And so the ordained order that God has set forth is that God is the head, Christ is under him, Man is under Christ, woman is under man. And so that is not saying that a woman is inferior. That's not saying that um, a woman is, is less in any way. It's saying that this is the order that God has set up. And so when we talk about the head, we're talking about authority and responsibility. We're talking about, again, Jesus is the head of, of every man. Uh, man is the head of woman, God is the head of Christ. And often we see a rebellion of that. You know, man has a, na as a, as there's a, a natural, because of the fall, because of the sin nature, to rebel against God, to rebel against what God says, and that's out of God's order. Uh, and we see that Christ has, displays a loving submission to the God, even though he's equal. So we know that the, the Trinity, they are equal but yet we see that Christ has yielded to his Father. And that's the example that he set before us. Um, because God has ordained this order. And in the Old Testament, in Proverbs, it talks about that women had responsibilities and duties equal to what we would call today business. So, uh, again, people have taken and twisted this verse and tried to say, well, you know, a woman's place is in the household, and she should be cooking and cleaning and doing the laundry. That, that's not what the Scripture says at all. The, the Scripture is saying that there's an order to things, but that women are allowed to conduct business. The women are allowed to be in the workplace. And so sometimes we get those things twisted, and we take and we put the connotation of what's in our culture right now. Um, and so when we talk about this, this goes against what our culture says today, because there is a drive to d diminish men and diminish manliness and things like this. And what God is saying is this is the order that he's put into place. 
Um, and sometimes that can be difficult to hear, but again, we're looking at what the Word of God says. In the fourth and fifth verse, he said, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. Uh, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. So in the fourth verse, he's talking about men praying or prophesying, and they're having their head covered. Uh, and so having your head covered in that time was a sign of authority. That was a symbol of authority. So he's saying that a, a man with, uh, with, with a wrap or with a hat or something like that, um, they were dishonoring God because they were wearing that as a symbol of authority versus having my head uncovered, which is a, a, a type of submission. And <clears throat> he said, you know, you remove your hat to show respect. And, you know, we see that even in our culture today. You know, you come in a building, you uh, come in a school, you come in a church, you remove your hat out of respect. The fifth verse, though, he says, but every woman uh, be not covered, let her, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm one ahead. Every woman prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head, for that is even all one if she were shaven. So first off here, he's talking about them praying or prophesying. He's talking about women preaching. And, you know, you see some denominations that they talk about, you know, women, women can't preach or women can't be in those roles, or they'll let a woman preach, but she can't be up on the stage. Well, right here we see in, in the scriptures a woman praying or prophesying. Well, if you're praying or prophesying, then you, you are preaching. Um, but what he's talking about is he's talking about their hair. Um, and he's basically saying, um, uh, you know, a, a woman shouldn't have short hair. Now, you can get into a debate, well, what's short hair? Well, what's long hair? And again, you can get into legalism with, uh, you know, an uh, old Pentecostal holiness. You know, the women didn't cut their hair, and they had the, the you know, the Pentecostal beehive, right? And they would wrap their hair up. That's not what God's talking about, but he's talking about, again, falling into what the world. So during that time, a woman with really short hair uh, was could have been a prostitute, uh, could have been uh, a, a lesbian, or could have been someone that was an adulteress. And so that was kind of how they identified in those days. And so <clears throat> that's not saying today that, some, that a, a female with short hair is going to go to hell. That's not what that's saying at all. But he's talking about looking like the world. And so, again, our Christian liberty at that time, Paul is telling them, you... You can have short hair, but are you glorifying God? Are you so close to the world in your appearance that you are not following what God's saying? And so, um, you know, we're not, we're not the hair police. We're not here to, to talk about, well, the length and, well, your hair is only five inches long, and so you're going to hell, and six inches long, and so you're going to heaven. That's not what we're getting into. And if you go back to what we we're talking about with the sacrificed uh, meat, it's the same thing. We're delving in, into all these little details versus looking at what Paul's saying as the whole. So her hair, uh, in 11 and 15, her hair is given for a covering. For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn, but it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or sa sh shaven, let her be covered. So again, talking about um, covering their head. If a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Uh, again, this is 1 Corinthians 11 and 15. 11 and 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is in the image and glory are reflected of God. But the woman is the expression of glory of the man. And it, it goes into, uh, right into the 8th verse. I'm going to go ahead and read into that. It says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. So, woman came from man. But now, after woman came from man, now man comes from woman. And so, the, the two are intertwined. And so, as he's talking about this, he's saying, uh, you know, Eve was a helpmate to Adam. So, as Adam 
is coming in and God puts him in charge of the garden and he's naming things and God realizes he needs a helpmate. And so he's given the woman as a helpmate. And so Eve was formed from the rib of Adam. Again, it doesn't mean a lesser being, but it means the woman was created on account of the man to be a companion and a helpmate. And so, uh, we, again, we have to understand this dynamic and this balance. And there's, uh, you know, there's drawbacks to being the head of the household because there's a time you have to make a decision and you have to make sure, am I making this decision that's best for my family? And, and if you're wise, you consult, you know, as a man, you consult your wife and, and make a part of the decision. Uh, but again, this is the order that God has set in place. It says, for this is the cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Uh, does not specify outside of the home or church. Uh, it doesn't indicate that women are inferior. Power on her head equals submission. And so something that we have to understand, a lot of times we think someone that's powerful, we think someone that's strong is they stand up and they're bold. And, uh, but what he's saying here is that Submission is what we are to do as Christians. And in our walk with God, we have to submit to God's will because there's times where there's things we don't want to do, things we don't want to follow, but yet we are submitting to God's will. And he's saying that there's power in submission. And just like the woman submits to the man, the man submits to God or or to Jesus, and Jesus submits to God, we see this order that God has ordained. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. And so when he says, nevertheless, he's bringing them back to, but I need you to, you know, I need you to understand. Nevertheless, neither is independent of the other. The woman came from man, but the man came from the woman. Um, and it takes both together to make things work. It takes both the man and the woman. We have different things that, that men have a role for and women have a role for, and it takes both of those in the home to make things work. And, and understanding those things and understanding what God has ordained brings peace and harmony in the home. For as the woman is of the man, the 12th verse even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. And so he talks about the partnership. He talks about, you know, he's talking here about the, the woman is not to be the, you know, she's not to be lorded over. The man is not to, you know, get in there and make me a sandwich. You know, that's not the, that's not the, the, the take that he's talking about. And he's saying a man shouldn't govern by fear. But it should be a a union, it should be a companionship, it should be a partnership for them to work together. The 13th verse, it says, Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray pray unto God uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame to him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. So let's break this down. Uh, he starts here uh, with the 13th. He, uh, he says, Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? And so the Jewish tradition at that time was that no one prayed with an uncovered head. And he is saying this, you know, he's saying that uh, even though that's Jewish tradition, so we go back to traditions. And is it a tradition inspired by God, or is it a tradition inspired by man? And he says, does not even the nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a shame to him? So, again, we go into, just like we talked about short hair with a woman, uh, uh, long hair is not, not, is, not, is not saying that it's a sin. Paul had long hair for a time in Acts because he took a vow. It's just not the norm. Again, we're not the hair police, but... What God's saying is, is, you know, what is the norm? What is the expectation? And, and understand, again, is what we're doing glorifying God. Um, 
He says, but if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Uh, so he's talking, you know, the ordained order. Um, again, man being submitted to God, woman to submitted to man, and then talking about the order and harmony of how God has set this up. And understanding that if we follow what God has laid out, there's harmony. That there's harmony in the house. That there's harmony in how things are proceeding. Um, and, and you can see this, and I'm, I'm not beating up single mothers or single dads. I'm not saying anything that. But we can see that there's, there's struggles because there's, you know, as a man, there's things that I can't fill that role for my daughters. And there's things that as a woman, my, my wife can't fill that role for, for my daughters. Uh, you know, I, I want to be the example to my young daughters of how a man should treat a woman. Because how I treat their mother is how they'll allow themselves to be treated. And so that's very difficult for a single parent to demonstrate that. And so that's why the, the order in the home and, and how things are ordained and how we're teaching our children, it's the same thing, uh, it's the same thing uh, with, with, the, with the young boy in the house. We see you know, the father teaching him how to, be a, how to be a man, but we also see the mother teaching him how it's acceptable for a wife to treat a husband. And so we have to keep that in mind as we're, as we're going through and talking and we're teaching our children more by what we say than, more by what we do than what we say. And so he's talking to here again about the order of things. But if, it, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. So he's saying none of these are sins, but he's saying these are things that you sh should consider. And again, we're all at different walks. You know, when we have someone come in and, 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 and they're a sinner, or even if they're saved, we don't know where they're at with their walk with God. It's not our job to judge. It's not our job to get up and say, well, you should, you should be doing this. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And that's where in teaching, as we're teaching on these Wednesday nights, as we're having worship, that, that as fellowship happens those things will be taught. Those things will be, will be brought to light. And so, again, he's talking about, we, we go back to this Christian liberty, and he's saying, you know, uh, these, are not, these are not, if you do this, you're going to sin and, and, and end up in hell. He's pointing out and saying, these are things to consider. These are things that you should talk about. Is what you're doing glorifying God? Is what you're doing to the order of, and expectations that God has for us. The 17th verse, he says, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you came together in church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So he's been talking to them, and, and now he's going to chastise them a little bit. In the 17th verse, again, I, I, now in this I declare to you, I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for worse. So he's shif shif shifting gears to his next topic, um, that he is glad that they are coming together. And as worshipers, you know, as human beings, we, we, we are social creatures. And it's good for us to fellowship. It's good to fellowship with fellow Christians um, because we, we help each other, Right? I'm, I'm not having to worry about going and, and uh, listening to someone curse. I'm not having to worry if I'm going out and, and someone's drinking or, or being involved in things they shouldn't be uh, when I'm with Christians and I'm fellowshipping. And so he's telling them, it's good that you came and fellowshiped. In Hebrews, uh, Paul talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So the problem here is the division that's going on in the church, the cliques that are going on in the church. And while we can tie this into uh, you know, people not fellowshipping with one another, we can also talk about the, the divisions that we see within, within the church itself. Because you know, we, we, there's, no, there's no denominations. Paul never talks about uh, a Pentecostal denomination and a Baptist denomination and a Methodist. 
It's just, it's the body of Christ. And so sometimes we allow these divisions to come in and it's causing problems. And so Paul says, I hear that there be divisions and and I believe it. He says, "I, I believe what I'm hearing. He goes into the 19th verse, For there must also be heresies among you, that they which were approved may be made manifest among you. And so when he's talking about heresies, uh, he's talking about a choice, a party. Uh, earlier, Paul dealt with divisions. <clears throat> he talked about, you know, some of you have, have, have taken from Paul, some of you have taken from Apollos, and he's talking about theological there. Uh, but here, it, it's practical, it's divisions during gatherings. And he says, For there must be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. So heresies are, are again, they're, they're factions, they're parties, they're groups. Uh, and Paul points out um, that these factions allow you to see who the true Christians are. Uh, and, and the thing is, is, is what's in our spirit and what's truly in our soul will come to light. There's those times where there's those things that happen that you can see, okay, who's truly invested in, in walking this way and you know, who's here as a social committee. And again, it's not an issue with doctrine, but the fallen state of man. Um, he talks about those that stir up things uh, and, and avoiding those people that cause divisions. And so when, when we see a division and, and we see that there's a stirring up and an issue, identifying what's causing that division. Uh, and, and if we step outside the Christian world for a minute, uh, you know, there's, all those pe- there's people that we've worked with that they're always in the middle. You know, they're always stirring the pot. You know, they may not be the ones, ca- they may not be the ones, ca- you know, directly causing things, but they're the ones that they're, they're talking to Sally over here and they're talking to Susie over here. And when they're with Jim, they're talking about Bob. And when they're with Bob, they're talking about Jim. They're causing divisions. And so what Paul is talking about is those people in the church that cause those divisions and to understand that What's the common denominator there? What's the common factor of what's causing these divisions to rise up? So he says, For in eating, everyone taketh before the other his own supper, and one is hungry, and one is drunken. I'm sorry, let me back up. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's supper. So he's not talking about when they come together to, to have communion. He's talking about a potluck. And, and, you know, that's one of those traditions, I'm sure glad that it stayed in the church, that we like to eat. We like to get together and we like to fellowship, right? Uh, usually when we get together in the church, usually there's some sort of food involved. So he's talking about them having potluck suppers. And again, he's saying this is good, this is right. Uh, <clears throat> for in eating, everyone taketh before the other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. And so we know Corinth, we've talked about, Corinth was a wild place. Uh, you know, I, I, you compare it to Las Vegas, to, you know, uh, New York City, some of these places that it's, it's loud and raucous and there's all kind of stuff going on. Um, and unfortunately, these celebrations had made them into the church. So there were these loud celebrations and people are drunk in the church. And he's saying, so that's an issue. And then he's saying, one is hungry, and basically they were bringing their food, and you know how, how a potluck normally works is everybody brings something and, and shares, and it's, it's share and share alike. But what the Corinthian church was doing was the rich people in the congregation were bringing all this food over here, and they were just making gluttons of themselves and eating and, and you know, making four or five plates And then you had the poor people in the church over here. There's a division, and and they're just left with with the little food that they brought. And Paul's telling them that's wrong. You should bring everything together, and everyone should be full, and everyone have a chance uh, to eat. And so, Matthew, to drink to an intoxication. And I won't get into all the details here, um, but as you read the Bible, and, you know, people sometimes want to talk about, well, you know, if, if you just drink socially or you just drink every now and then, that's not a sin. And that's not what the Bible says. And again, it's one of those things that um, 
you don't have to get in an argument with someone. You don't have to get in a biblical discussion because they'll take and they'll say, well, what about this scripture and what about that scripture? Again, we go back to what Paul is saying. I'm not going to debate that with you. This is what I believe. This is what I believe the Word says. This is what God has said. And when we come to those things, uh, again, when we come to those things that you're not for sure, and you go, I just, I don't know. That's where we take that to God. That's where we talk to God and we say, God, I'm confused on this. Because God hasn't given us a spirit of confusion, but he's opened our eyes, opened our spiritual eyes as we read this word. So he says, what, have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And so he's reprimanding them. And he says it three times. And we know in the Bible something is repeated that is important. And, and three times is usually the, the extreme. So he's saying, I, I don't praise you for this. You've, you've excluded one another. You've not walked in love. And again, think about to what he said earlier is, I, I, I want to show love for my brother and sister. And if you have, if, if you have an abundance and your brother or your sister doesn't have an abundance, well, you shouldn't sit there and eat all your food and look at them and let them be hungry. You should share. And again, we see that sin nature kicking in. Uh, no one has to teach a child how to be stingy. If you put two children up here on the stage and one toy, at some point they're going to fight over it. Because what do we have to teach children? We have to teach them how to share and so Paul is almost talking to them like little kids here, and he's telling them, this is so wrong. How can you look at your brother or sister in Christ and see that they aren't as blessed as you are, and yet you're just going to leave them with what they have? So he says, I praise you not for that. He says, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So he's telling them that he's received these words from God. And, you know, reprimanding is, is one of those things, whether it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pastor reprimanding the flock, whether it's reprimanding your spouse, whether it's reprimanding your children, that's not always a fun thing. And, you know, sometimes when we're mad at someone, it's easy to let them know what they're doing wrong. But you can hear as Paul writes this, uh, he has a, a true passion for this church in Corinth. And while he's getting on them, he's doing so in love. And he's telling them, uh, he's telling them that he's received this word from God, and the night Jesus was arrested, it was a foreign power and betrayed by his own people. So Rome arrested him, but it was the Jewish people that were the underlying cause of it. And it, it was ultimately, it was Judas who turned on him for 30 pieces of silver. And he said, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, and do this in remembrance for of me. So now he's shifting to talking about communion. Uh, and he's talking about the Last Supper, which was a Passover meal. And the Passover meal uh, was Israel. They were commemorating them uh, being free from Egypt. And so that was the Passover meal. And so he's talking about this communion, and he's going into and he's going to explain the purpose of communion and what was supposed to be happening. And... He talks about this is a connection to the death and resurrection of Christ. And when they had this Passover, their bread had no leaven in it. And leaven is what makes bread rise. And so it was a symbol. Uh, they used that as a symbol of sin because they didn't put any leaven in the bread. And, uh, you know, you've heard that scripture, a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. And so they're, they're using that as an, as an expression. So no leaven equals no sin. The bread that they, did, that they used also had stripes and marks, and it represented uh, Christ's broken body. Uh, you know, him taking stripes on the cross for our, our, uh, for our healing. And so, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. It says, after the same manner, he took the cup, 
when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, ratified and established. In my blood, this do you as often as you drink it. Remember me. And so, as he's talking about um, this, this tradition, uh, he goes back to talking about this tradition. When we, when we take communion, it's very serious. And we are remembering what Christ did for us. We're honoring, uh, that, new, we're honoring that New Testament. And he's saying this, this new covenant was ratified by my blood. When he, and he was telling them, you know, he was getting ready to, to go to the cross. And he's telling them that this signifies the covenant that was sealed by my blood. This signifies the grace that is found because of what Jesus did on the cross. And the cup that he chose was known as the redemption cup. Uh, and the cup was originally, uh, they had multiple glasses that they drunk out of, and they had one that was the redemption cup. And it was tied to, again, originally with the Passover, redemption from Egypt. And so we're doing that when we do communion, we are doing it in remembrance of what Jesus done for us. And it's a symbol of his body that was broken, that was without sin. And it was a symbol of his blood that was shed, that was innocent blood for our sins. And so as oft as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So there's, there's different views when you talk about communion. Um, some people believe, try to say it's physically his body, uh, but it's spiritual and, and it's, it's, it is a symbol, but it's more than a symbol. And we are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. And that is we're preaching about, the, about, about God. We're, we're taking this message of the cross. We're taking this good, glad, joyous news of what God has done for us, and we're sharing it with the world. And so as Paul is, is talking and he's talking about these things, you go back to what he said about Everything we do, we're doing it for the glory of God. Everything we do is to, is to promote the gospel and to share this good work. So uh, I've run out of time, and so we'll stop right there, and we'll pick up next week. Uh, again, we thank you so much for coming out, and I'll turn it over to Sister Angela. Thank you, Brother Ryan. That was good. Um, again, thank everyone for coming tonight, um, whether you're here joining us by, webca by webcast. Um, we're hoping and praying that the Bible study and the Bible class that we're doing every week is a blessing to everyone here. Um, before I close, I just want to pray over the offering and also just pray over us for the rest of the week. If you would bow your heads with me. Lord, thank you so much again for bringing us all together tonight. Um, we ask that those who give, uh, whether it be uh, by text to give or here uh, in the sanctuary at the kiosk outside, Lord, that you would just bless the monies that come in, Lord God, that you would stretch it to meet all of the needs uh, of our ministries throughout the church, Lord, that and that we're able to continue to move forward, Lord God, just carrying out your will for this church and everyone here. Lord, we ask for your covering over every family that's represented here tonight, God, that you would continue to keep and protect us, Lord God, by your power, that you would just lead and guide us by your Holy Spirit, Lord, and you would be with us throughout the rest of this week. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love and your forgiveness, Lord. Thank you for your grace and mercy that you show us every single day. Be with us until we see each other again on Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are dismissed. <laughs> Thank you for watching and please subscribe. You can also find more of our videos in our archives at ChristUnveiled.org. We'll see you next time.